Hi, you're listening to the Stefan Levera podcast, a show about Bitcoin and Austrian economics. Today for episode 154, my guest is Nick, BT Econometrics, and previously known as Fraudster. He's the guy who tried to disprove Plan B's stock-to-flow analysis and actually ended up finding out that it was co-integrated. So definitely an interesting episode. So remember, this podcast is brought to you by Kraken, one of the world's leading Bitcoin exchanges. Kraken offers a high-quality platform with high trading volume and low fees, no minimum or hidden fees. Kraken also have 24-7 support, so it's easy to get signed up and get support if you need it. And Kraken offer Kraken Pro mobile app. Kraken Pro delivers all the security and features you love about the Kraken exchange in a beautiful mobile-first design. There's some new updates on the app, and you can now refine the timeframes for charting. You can add markets and list your favorites, and you can receive vibrating feedback on all major actions. With Kraken, there's also margin trading up to five times, and there's also futures up to 50 times leverage to benefit from price swings or hedge your price risk. Go to kraken.com to sign up. This episode also brought to you by Unchained Capital, a Bitcoin financial services company empowering customers with financial freedom and control. Their products and services are built on the foundation of multi-sig. So Unchained offer these two of three multi-signature vaults. You can use Trezor and Ledger, and Cold Card is coming soon. It's an easy web setup, and these are a great option if you're thinking through how best to secure your Bitcoin. If you want to access liquidity without selling your Bitcoin, Unchained offer collateralized loans. You can put up some Bitcoin and get USD liquidity. All Bitcoin is stored on-chain, dedicated multi-sig addresses, and it's never rehypothecated. I'm really impressed with Unchained. They've got awesome services and valuable content. Go and check them out at unchained-capital.com. Next up is CypherSafe, cyphersafe.io, producing the Cypher Wheel product. So you've invested in a Bitcoin hardware wallet. Are you keeping your BIP39 12 or 24 word seed backed up? Is it backed up in a way that's fireproof, waterproof, rustproof, petproof, and tamper evident? The Cypher Wheel comes in a wheel shape. It masks the words of your seed and... You can also make use of the padlock tamper evidence seal so you know if it's been opened. And the way it works is you basically slide in the tiles, four tiles per word. Make sure you or your loved ones have access to your bitcoins if an accident occurs. Orders are going out, so go and order yours at cyphersafe.io. Lastly, Swan Bitcoin. Bitcoin is better money, and you want to stack it regularly without manual processing, right? If you're in the US, you must look up Swan Bitcoin at swanbitcoin.com. You can link any major US bank account via ACH and auto buy weekly or monthly. The Bitcoin is delivered to your wallet or stored with a licensed and regulated custodian. Swan Bitcoin's focus is on education and Bitcoin advocacy. Jan Pritzker, he's the author of Inventing Bitcoin, he's their CTO, and Brady from Citizen Bitcoin is head of education. I'm involved as an advisor with a small equity stake also. So there's givebitcoin.io for your Bitcoin gifting and go to swanbitcoin.com for your automated Bitcoin stacking. So for those of you who are not familiar, I recommend checking out some of the earlier episodes with Plan B prior to this episode. Those are episodes 67, 86, and 122 in particular, because Nick's work builds off of Plan B's stock-to-flow model, and funnily enough, it was where he was trying to disprove the model and then actually ended up finding out that it was co-integrated. So we talk about Nick's background, co-integration, what does it mean, Engel Granger test, mean reversion indicator, and shitcoins riding Bitcoin's coattails. Here is the interview. Nick, welcome to the show. Hi, Stephen. So Nick, uh, obviously I've been following some of your work. We've discussed some of your work recently on the show in one of my earlier episodes with Plan B. We'd love to hear a bit more about you. Obviously, it sounds like you've got a bit of a statistician background. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so... My um, history, I guess, is I've I've been in uh, drinking water quality, so I, I look after sort of the public health aspect of water production, and um, as a consequence of that, I need to do a lot of statistical modelling, and um, that's essentially where my statistical background comes from. So it's not economic or finance or anything like that, which, in a way might be good i think to get the perspective of another kind of uh statistician you've certainly made some very important and interesting contributions in this whole debate debacle whatever you want to call it right yeah, yeah. Uh, so tell us a little bit about how you got into bitcoin what was it that drew you into bitcoin yeah so look um bitcoin for me is something that i didn't really get into very early on um I, I, I'm sort of 
a later entrant into Bitcoin. I came in in the 2017 bull run. So I've been, um, I've been learning ever since then. And really, it's only since 2019 that I've become permanently in Bitcoin. Like I, I only believe in Bitcoin basically now. And it's taken, I don't know, probably about a year to get to that point um, from, from when I first entered. And it's sort of after I learned about Bitcoin, I learned how bad everything else was. If that makes any sense. <laughs> so you kind of came in thinking, oh yeah, crypto, yeah. all this different cryptocurrency. Yeah. And then after a while, you've kind of zeroed into Bitcoin or you focused in on that. Yeah, that's right. I've, well, I, I started uh, noticing that Bitcoin was the really the only cryptocurrency sort of with any merit, um, if that makes any sense. Yeah, okay. And so what were some of your, I guess, influences coming into it? Like, I presume you've read Safetyne or obviously you've been working with Plan B. Any other kind of influences on your thought? Well, but Plan B is by far the biggest influence um, because back in, I think it was March 2019, um, when he came out with the stock to flow model, basically I thought it was rubbish. Um, and I thought I'm going to prove that that's rubbish. I think that's just a spurious regression. And I'm going to show everyone that it's just, it's not worth anything. And I, I tried really hard. <laughs> I really tried to prove it wrong. Um, and I tried all sorts of crazy models to um, um, try and you know invalidate the theory and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, it all kind of just pointed to that it wasn't wrong. Um, so I had to, um, I think by August, early August, I told Plan B that, look, I think you're probably right. <laughs> and, uh, and I was going to write an article and I wrote an article um, for August 2019, falsifying stock to flow. It's a model of Bitcoin value. Fantastic. And uh, you mentioned the term spurious regression. Can you explain what that is for the listeners? Okay. Um, well, so when we do a regression, we are just basically saying there's a correlation between two variables. So two things are moving together or um, there's something that's happening at the same time as something else. Um, with time series, what tends to happen is if they're, what we say, integrated, um, so they're, they're moving up, if they're all moving up together, there's a trend in them and that can sort of misplace the regression. Like we see that there's a correlation between the number of Nicolas Cage films and the number of deaths by suicide or something like that, right? Um, from the um, Spurious Regressions site. Um, and it's it's completely invalid. There's nothing to that. Um, another correlation, for example, is, you know, there's a correlation between um, people who eat rice and black hair, but there's nothing to that, right? Um, it's basically just a spurious association. So way to get around that in time series anyway is to see if the difference between them um, doesn't change. And that, I guess, is called co-integration, where we have a stationary difference between two variables. Um, and that's something that I'd identified early on as a way to try and um, prove Plan B's model wrong, was to say, if, well, if these two variables are spuriously correlated, so they're going up, but they're going up not together, then they won't be co-integrated, but they were. Co-integrated. So Plan B's work and some of your work, it's viewed more in a historical context, not a not necessarily a predictive context, right? Um, yeah. Well, yes. Um, so that that's I mean that's true of anything. We can we can really only say what's happened, and we can estimate what will happen based on what has happened. And given that there is, um, so given there is this evidence of this relationship being so strong for so long like i just i just tweeted just now actually where i um i looked at the um the ordinary least squares model for stock to flow um and um calculated it for each day for a period for for a period of time from 2010 to now and found the residuals that's the difference between the model value and the price um and then looked at the residuals of that and uh, they were stationary which um, to me indicates that not only is it heavily co-integrated, like these things are moving together, but the the co-integration is getting stronger. So it's getting like the 
the relationship itself is actually becoming um, more well defined with time. Um, and um, I, I did I did send out the the Engel Granger statistic um, a little earlier on. It showed it going down over time as well, which is more evidence of that. Um, so I think what that to me says is that yes, what we have at the moment is true for the past. But I mean, if it's true for the past, there is a pretty good chance it's probably true for the future too. Um, I think that's probably different to what Plan B thinks, um, but. I mean, I'm becoming more and more convinced that it's a, a valid, non-spurious relationship that basically isn't changing with time. It's getting stronger. Right. And so I guess if we go back to the first step of it is understanding, okay, there's an R squared, right? And this is the ordinary least squares regression. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit about what that means and what does it mean when R squared is a high value? Sure. Um, so an R squared is the correlation, the determination of... Um, correlation coefficient. So it basically gives you the um, amount of variance explained by the model. Um, so in this case, when it's 0.95, then 95% of the variance in the true um, value is explained well by the model. Um, it's a bit funny in the log space because um, the, like, the logarithms sort of um, they make really wide distances appear close together um, and that can actually have an effect on the R squared. So if you de-log the um, model, right? So you look at the linear model price and the linear price and take the residuals of that, um, the R squared is much closer to like 0 0.5, 0 0.6 uh, in the linear space. Um, so it's still explaining a large proportion, a really large proportion of the value um, it's just not that. That's why you get that really wide range in the model prediction zone, I guess. Um, yeah. So that's that's a criticism that I think um, I've had for a while and other people have leveled is that being in the log space, it, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, this difference as we go on. Yeah. And can you explain what it means to use log log? So we're using logarithm of the price and logarithm of the model. Yep. So that's... Basically, we're just taking the log of um, the price, so the the log function, I guess, the log to base E, and uh, the log of the model value. And um, we, we, when we create the OLS, I should say, we create an OLS based on the log of price uh, and the log of stock to flow, and this gives us this log log model, I guess. So we get a, a log model price and a log model price versus a log price, and then to put them back into linear space, we just exponentiate. So we, you know, exponentiate the log of the price, log of log price, sorry, and the uh, log of the model value. And we end up in the linear space again. And then once you're in the linear space, then you can do the uh, normal linear stuff. Okay. Uh, and can you tell us a little around uh, what is required to assess if something is co-integrated? So there's a couple of things you talk about in your article. One of them was stationarity and a couple other uh, concepts. Could you outline some of those for the listeners? Uh, sure. Um, so there's a there's a few steps we need to take um, in order to assess a model like that. So the first thing I did in, in the article, um, getting to the co-integration a little bit later on, uh, was look at basic diagnostics of the ordinary least squared regression because these are things that are often overlooked and are really easy to reject a model. So that's obviously the first thing I went to. So we look at uh, linearity, that's okay. Heteroscedasticity, that's uh, hard to, uh, basically the variability of the predicted outcome versus the um, estimated outcome. Um, and we end up with not being able to reject the model um, against those diagnostic tests um, and the uh, normality in error, which is the shape of the residuals. It should be you no know, roughly Gaussian in shape and um, it kind of, it, it basically is, it does have, I mean, it doesn't pass a, a formal test for normality, but that sort of doesn't matter. It just has to be normal enough. Otherwise you get uh, expanded variances in the, um, in the coefficients and things, um, which is detailed in the article there. Um, so all of that's done. And then we look at the um, station, the, this covenant, the, Sorry, we look at the integration of the variables. Um, so we see if there's um, 
if these variables are stationary or not. So we, we're checking to see if the first difference of each of these variables um, is uh, moving in a trend or if it's around zero um, or if the second difference, if it's second order co-integration, second order integration. Um, in this instance, they're both first order integrated um, and we're able to then say, okay, if we both, if we have two variables that are first order integrated, then we can do a um, co-integration test on these variables. Um, and that, that tests whether the difference between these two variables um, remains stationary with time. So stationarity, as I said before, is the idea that there's no trend, right? There's no trend in this difference. It's always going to be higher or lower. It might be the same as the mean or whatever. It's at zero. It might be higher than lower than zero, but it's always going to be within that range. It's not going to go up or it's not going to go down. It's going to remain in a, in a stationary zone. Um, so if that difference remains stationary, these two variables are said to be co-integrated. Um, in the in the article, they're going to um, a bit more of a complex model called a um, VECM, um, which was just really I was just trying to prove the stock to flow model wrong more. Um, and again, kind of got the result I wasn't expecting. Um, it's it said that co-integration is strong. I even adjusted for um, the time trend. So there's a trend in that initial model. Um, and it still said um, that the stock to flow variable was an important co-integrated predictor of, um, of of the market price, of the market cap in that instance, sorry. So I think there's a, there's a bunch of other stability checks that we, we do there um, that probably aren't probably don't need to explain too much, um, but it, the, the essence of it is that um, the VECM was stable. So the, vec, the, um, the error correction model for that particular um, set of variables was stable, and which meant that we could use it going forward. One thing I think important to note though, is that the stock to flow variable isn't random. Like it's, it's, it's random to an extent, it's random on a daily extent, but it's not truly random, which meant that we, um, we kind of know where the model's going to go. And can you tell us a little bit about, uh, I'm not sure the correct pronunciation, a kike information criteria, A-K-A-I-K-E? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so that's uh, basically a way of saying how, um, how much information the model needs to, how much information the model needs to be accurate so if if a, if a parsimonious model is presented versus a very complex model so one that's got two variables versus one that's got seven and they give very similar r squareds kind of thing the, the parsimonious one will give a better aic compared to the complex one just because it uses less information so it's kind of adjusting for you know people will throw millions of variables at something to try and get some relationship it's trying to adjust for that um concept i guess so it um it it's sort of quantifying the um the amount of effort gone into modeling. And so in your experience as a statistician, using a model with you know this number of variables, is that relatively low compared to what you might have worked with uh, professionally? <laughs> and, and, and I guess that's the other important thing too. It it is um sort of model specific. So if if you're comparing um very similar things, so say Bitcoin price with other single variable Bitcoin price models, then the AIC is appropriate. But you can't really compare the AIC of one one variable model to the AIC of some other one variable model if it's not relevant, like if it's not the same thing, because it could the the variances could be higher or it's 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 very um, domain specific. I see. Yeah. Okay, and so can you tell us a little bit about uh, your website now? Because you've got a bunch of indicators on here on your website, uh, BTC kind of bitconometrics.com. Do you want to just start with some of these like residual likelihood indicator? What's that? Um, sure. So that that's basically a non-parametric way of estimating the probability of a residual. So as I said before, the residual is the difference between the model price and the actual price um, and Given we know the residuals are stationary from the co-integration analysis, we can then use 
um, these likelihood techniques to estimate probabilities. Um, and that sort of gives you a, an idea of when things are going to turn. So the lower that likelihood is, the more likely um, something's going to happen next to adjust for that likelihood. So if it's a really low likelihood and the residuals are high compared to the model, so the, well, the model is high compared to the price, sorry, um, then the likelihood is high that the next price will be um, closer to the model, be lower. Um, so it's kind of a way to try and um, capture the tops and bottoms, um, but in a way that gives you a quantified amount of information. So you can, you know, people say, oh, well, where, how do you pick the tops? How do you pick the bottoms? Um, this way it gives you a number that you can use to um, say, well, this is sort of 5% likely to be the top or, you know, less than 5% likely to not be the top. Um, and that way you can use that to say, um, uh, I'm going to put this much, um, this much into that particular bet, I guess. Um, yeah. And so I guess one way I, I've heard it explained is it's sort of like a, it's like a rubber band effect, right? That the more it kind of stretches out, it kind of, now it's like pulling back harder. Is that another way to analogize what you're talking about? Here? Sure. Sure. I mean, that that's, that's the essence of the co-integration. Um, so if, if there's a, if there's this co-integrated relationship remaining there, which um, it seems to be there um, and remaining strong, um, then there will be this pullback down. And um, I, I guess it's a way to capture that, the strength of the rubber band. Um, so if it's gonna snap back really fast or if it's just got a little bit of tension on it, um, then that residual likelihood, that kind of gives you that. I see, yeah. And I guess that would work both ways, right? When we are under the model predicted price and when we are well over the model predicted price, uh, it's measuring how much it's going to kind of rubber band back to the model. That's right. That's right. Yep. Um, and it, it'll, I mean, nothing's a hundred percent certain in this. So, uh, but it, it will give you, um, what's happened previously. So that's what likelihood means. It means what's happened previously is this, uh, this residual had a really low chance of happening. And the next thing that happened was it, you know, snapped back really fast and, and it's sort of quantifying all that information from the past. So the, the way that this breaks is the co-integration breaks down. If the co-integration breaks down, then all of this doesn't really matter. Um, but I, I, I don't see it breaking down. I've, I've, I see it getting stronger. Bullish as. <laughs> uh, so the, so the, uh, how, how about the mean reversion indicator? What's that? Uh, that's very much the same thing, just a different, um, a different way of looking at it really. So that's just the residuals of the model, right? So the difference between the model and the, price um, on the on the log scale just so we keep it in that domain um, they will center around zero and again as it gets towards um, one side it'll have a bit of a stronger pullback and if it gets towards the other side it will pull back the other way um, and it's it's much the same sort of um, idea as that residual likelihood but um, sort of gives you a bit more of a direction I guess and you can add, then add um, the quantiles onto the mean reversion indicator. So you can say that, you know, previously the 95th percentile was here on this distribution of residuals. So we can expect that to continue if the distribution remains stationary. And if it's, you know, if it's the 95th percentile and it's pretty unlikely to go back much more than that for much longer. So we can say that that's probably going to be at a top. If it's the fifth percentile, then it's going to be the bottom, that kind of thing. And what's your view around this whole idea of uh, like multiples of the model price? So people are sort of trying to speculate about, you know, will it be two times the model price? Will it be three times the model price? Do you have any views on that? Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, three times, uh, it, it comes down to, again, I don't think, I don't think, I don't put much weight into the, um, the mean price. Other than that, that's the middle of the distribution. Um, so it could go either way. It could go um, up to the top. It could go down to the bottom um, of that band of residuals, um, whether it's two or three times the um, stock to flow mean price. Um, I mean, if it's if it's above the 95th percentile, then it's going to be a low chance of happening um, and probably a good time to offloads huh um 
but um, if it's below that, then, you know, the opposite is true. Um, I think probably, um, yeah, I, the, the stock to flow, was it the, the stock to flow multiple? Is that what you mentioned? Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a good quick way of people understanding the, you know, the rubber banding effect, but um, it's good to quantify that, I think, with the residual likelihoods, um, give, giving you a probability of that actual price. Do you have a view around uh, the different, so for example, with this coming halving, there's, you know, the model predicted price of 100,000 and then there's another one of around the 55,000. What's your view on which model you're preferring to use in terms of uh, what, what you're like doing your work on? Yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit murky, isn't it? It seems to be like people say, oh, it changes all the time or whatever, um, but it's not really. It's just that when you use different parts of data, you get slightly different coefficients. And in the log space, that's not very different. But when you exponentiate it, it's like fifty thousand dollars. So it's that. That's why we come back to if you if you're using the log space, it's really all about percentage change. Um, but if you're using linear space, then you can see the actual price differences. And um, like I said before, if you use the stock to flow model, you get an R squared in the linear space of close to about 0.5 rather than 0.95. Um, but I think for the long long run relationship, which is what we talk about for the co-integration stuff. Um, the log, the log space is the best space because you capture all of the previous information, you know, all the details in the lower, cause in the linear space, it's just, all you see is this big exponential curve, which doesn't really mean anything to anyone until you look at it in the log space. Um, so yeah, the, the different price estimates for the, um, for the future stock to flow value I don't put a lot of uh, effort into um, I on the website for example I just calculate the OLS every day and it it updates the model every day because um, as I've just shown um, just now the 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 residuals remain stationary even if you do that for all of the history of Bitcoin um, so it's I think better to focus on the difference to the model than to focus on the future potential outcomes of the model, the difference of the price to the model now. If that makes some sense, yeah. And also the, the, on some of the different graphing and charting, uh, some charts are showing on a daily basis and some are showing on like a yearly basis. So can you articulate your thoughts on that, on uh, ways to think about like what does it mean when you're looking at the daily versus say the 365 day sure sure well i th i think that comes down to how you interpret the the scarcity factor itself kind of thing so i mean the stock to flow ratio is calculated on an annual basis so you could argue that it should use you know yearly data um on that that alone um but people being people probably know you know come to know about the scarcity faster than a year so then you go, well, perhaps we should update that more than that, um, maybe monthly. And I've personally, I like the 14 days um, because, because it smooths it out enough and it um, sort of lines up with the difficulty adjustments, which I think perhaps tend to that scarcity as well um, a little bit. The Engel Granger cointegration test. So it says determining if two series are cointegrated by modeling the lag of the residuals against the first difference of the residuals. Yep. So uh, that's basically it. <laughs> you said it exactly how we do it. Um, we get the um, we get the model, find the residuals, find the dif first difference of the residuals, and model if the lag can predict the difference. And it's um, if it's uh, stationary residuals in that model, then we say it's co-integrated. And, and that's basically less than about minus three. It depends on the number of samples you're using and a whole bunch of things, but less than minus three, it's basically going to be co-integrated um, for the angle Granger statistic anyway. Yeah. And as we speak today uh, in early March, it is negative 11. And so your website here is showing basically or negative 11.74 but the idea is uh is that giving you an idea of whether it is breaking down um yeah well if it goes up <laughs> so if, if the angle grand statistic goes up to above minus three so if it gets to minus two um or, or higher than that then yeah co-integration is broken and these 
things that I've been saying are all untrue. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. But today we're very in the green. That's so, right, that's right. Uh, for listeners who are concerned, that's not a concern right now. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, great. So let's also talk about uh, some of the other stuff you were mentioning, which is instantaneous residual likelihood analysis, right? And this is, I think, you, what you've been speaking about recently on Twitter as well. So can you tell us what that is? What, how should we think about that? Well, again, this is um, the same sort of deal as the uh, residuals analysis, really, the residual likelihood analysis. But instead of calculating the model for today and then going back and calculating the residuals, what the re residuals would have been if we had the model today, it calculates the residuals as they were at that point in time. So we've calculated the, the model for each day and then we've got the residuals for that point in time and then calculated the likelihood of those residuals and just put them into a series, um, which I think gives me more confidence in the model because it's, you know, we have this idea that, oh, we calculate the model now and then go and back test it. But that's really with, you know, it's, it's kind of not true because we're looking at the model now that has all this extra data um, which could be influencing the outcome. Um, so if you go back and calculate the model at that point in time, how it would have seen, how you would have seen the model if you calculated it 2012 or whatever, and then found the residual of that day, and then you know 2013 calculate the residual of that day. That's what that kind of does, um, and it gives me um, gives me great confidence in the model. To be honest, that one, um, it's basically showing us that the model has been holding for all this time. Um, which is remarkable, really. Right. And so uh, one other question around the statistics of it. Uh, your website mentions the Kelly fraction. Okay. So what's that? Um, yeah, this is just something I threw in there um, just recently. It's the Kelly criterion. It's just a way of um, maximizing your bankroll. It's, um, probably, it's probably not... Um, like if, if you're going to use this yourself, you probably need to go and calculate it yourself. This is just a rough rule of thumb. Um, and it's, it's assuming equal odds and basically says, look, given the history of this likelihood, um, you probably should put um, this much of how much you're willing to lose into this bet. Um, and the Kelly criterion um, can be much more complex than that. And it's a way to, to maximize your bankroll over time, essentially. Okay, so that's for the, uh, the really advanced people out Absolutely. there? Absolutely. Yeah, if you don't know what that is, don't use that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, I'm just a hodler, right? I'm just stacking. I'm not really Trading. like trying to yeah. time tops and bottoms myself, yeah. but uh, for people who are interested to try to uh, understand from an analytical point of view or statistical point of view, that's there. Uh, but look, so we've spoken mostly about quantitative analysis. And I think that's, you know, from speaking to you, that sounds like that's really a wheelhouse, right? Uh, but what about your views from a qualitative perspective? What's informing that? And is that informing any of your analysis? I mean, yeah, yes, it is. I think because I, you know, I like I said earlier on, I've I went and focused on Bitcoin, um, and the reason for that is, you know, it's it's got it's the oldest coin, so it's got this the Lindy effect that people talk about. It's got the biggest network effect, so the, the Metcalf stuff there. Um, it's got the highest hash rate, so it's the most secure network, um, and it's it's really. Um, I, I mean, it's it's really quite amazing how how well it's worked for this amount of time, um, and without you know too many substantial errors um, in it, um, it's got like a really high uptime, ninety eight percent or something, right? Um, and then I had a look at Ethereum um, just recently, and it seems to co-integrate with the Bitcoin stock to flow value, which is kind of odd. Right, like why? Why is Ethereum co-integrating with the Bitcoin stock to flow value, not with the Bitcoin price, with the Bitcoin stock to flow value? It's really uh, I ha I haven't quite fully comprehended why, um, but I think it is basically people are spending these precious um, things, these precious satoshis, on um, on gambling on this uh, Ethereum thing, um, right? And and all of the you know all of the things that Ethereum sort of brings, like all the various rubbish ICOs, et cetera. Right. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, I mean, that might be uh, perhaps maybe I'm just confirming my own biases and it's confirmation bias, but my view is basically there's a lot of other shit coins out there and they are basically riding the coattails of Bitcoin. Yeah. And it sounds to me like what you're saying kind of supports that thesis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's exactly right, I think. 
Um, and there are there are some that do um, follow the Bitcoin price, like Litecoin, for example, does follow the Bitcoin price. Its own stock to flow doesn't predict it at all. It's obviously not working on the value of its own network. It really is, um, you know, riding Bitcoin, um, and we can, you know, we can predict where it's going to be based on um, Bitcoin's price level, essentially. Um, and there's a few others there that are um, yeah, like that, but really when they're just, when they're just uh, looking at the Bitcoin stock to flow and not the price, I, I, I'm still, I'm still kind of in the midst of fully understanding it, but I think that's basically on track that it is just riding Bitcoin's coattails. <laughs> All right. Well, unfortunately there's a lot of shit coiners who aren't going to like that, but uh, oh, well, we'll get a lot of uh, angry comments in the, in the threads after uh, this. But anyway, to that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, I think the, the deeper point is around, you know, causation, correlation, right? So this big, you know, everyone's always debating about, oh, correlation is not causation and so on. And the other thing that strikes out is, can it be that sometimes there are things that kind of work for reasons we don't really understand? And it just so happens that the stock to flow is the one thing that best models that. Yeah. That, I mean, that, that is that. So I've had this idea that perhaps there's um, an X variable, so there's stock to flow times X or stock to flow plus X equals price, or whatever. And we just don't know what that is yet. That, you know, mediating effect, mediating variable, uh, confounding variable, whatever. Uh, we're just not quite sure what that is. And that might explain things like when people say, oh, there's no demand in the model. How can this model work? You know, this kind of thing. Perhaps stock to flow is informing demand somehow. Yeah. And I, that's one uh, silly example. I was, uh, I can't remember exactly where I heard this, but it was something like, when the wind, the direction of the wind changed, then that would change the sex of reptiles. But it just so happened that that certain reptiles being born, like that, that was also being in, in self being driven by like what season you were in and so on. So it's like something else is, but it kind of it's still it's unrelated to happening at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, right. Um, I don't. So that that kind of change, I guess, then stock to flow would be um, a proxy, which is something I think we have with time. Um, so because of the, you know, the history behind stock to flow, where we know that it works for gold and things like that, um, I, I find it difficult to, um, to say that it would be a proxy for value, given that it works for value for other things. Um, if it didn't, um, then I'd be more open to saying it's probably a proxy. Um, but yeah, it, can't, it does kind of work for, um, various other precious metals as um, plan B has shown. Um, I see. Yeah. So in your view, then it's, it's, that's kind of going in the direction of saying it's not a proxy. It is the driver itself, or it is the causal kind of factor or the main explaining factor. Well, it's, is that it's at least, it's at least on the path. So it's, so, you know, we'll have an arrow of time, Bitcoin price here, and perhaps there's feedback loops and stuff. Right. Um, but they're on the path from here to here. Stock to flow is in there somewhere. Absolutely, I have no doubt because of that co-integrating relationship. It's something that um, uh, I'm, I'm quite sure, quite certain of that it's a, a non-spurious predictor of Bitcoin price. So that doesn't mean that it completely explains Bitcoin price. Um, it explains a good portion of it, um, and in the linear space, that's about fifty percent of it. Um, yeah, which is pretty high, really. Like in in the in the public health stuff that I do. To see an R squared above sort of point two is is crazy, you know. So point five in the linear space is amazing, really, and and point nine five on the log scale is just, uh, uh, you know, it's it's quite uh, it's quite a high value to have, um, and good confidence in this thing that, you know, from other other resources shows the same sort of correlation. Um, where something like time, where it does look like there's a relationship. But then you do the co-integration analysis and it doesn't co-integrate. And there's not really, I mean, there's not a really good explain explanation for why it would increase with time other than perhaps just, you know, adoption, that kind of thing. And that, by definition, I think is a proxy and the proxy could incorporate adoption. I mean, stock to flow increases with time as well, so it could incorporate stock to flow. So I think that's perhaps a better example of 
we started off off there with the, with the wind changing, and it was just because of the seasons, and you know, you correlate the wind changing to the change in gecko sex and that kind of thing. That's what time is. Um, stock to flow is the season. Yeah, interesting stuff. Hey, so then I, the other question I've got is, what are your thoughts on if or when the model breaks down? Yeah, well, it'll happen um, pretty slowly, actually. Because, well, I, I, unless there's some really, really drastic things that happen, but it will, it, it's like, so when we have the halving, um, the angle range statistic will increase. It'll go up from minus 11. Um, historically, it's bumped up like, you know, a couple of points or something. Um, but if it goes up to in the minus three zone, um, and then we're going to have um, to look at it a lot closer to make sure the co-integration is still there. Um, and really, we probably need about a year of data after the halving to say for sure this co-integration is gone, or if it's not gone, then we can still use it. Because uh, we can't, I mean, we can't say it's not going to go the year after that, but it hasn't gone the year after the halving, then it probably will remain, if that makes some sense. Um, it, it, if we see the price sort of um, drop after the halving and remain at current levels for a year, um, I would say the model's basically useless um, but if it's gone on a slow trend up towards the end of the year and we start seeing the residuals come back to you know nice stationary residuals then you know you you can't really say that co-integration is broken then so the model would still be useful um, so a lot of these people are saying like oh when you know the halving happens in may and the price doesn't go to 100k is everyone gonna forget this model it's kind of it's a bit of a straw man. They're, they're putting this argument up that isn't an argument. Um, it's not really what we're saying. Um, we're saying that this model will, will be useful and probably should be useful in the future. And we can tell how useful it is given the data after about a year after the halving, which I think plan B said like uh, December, 2021, which is fine. Right, right. And I think, yeah, because I think it's like a straw man of the position to say, oh, the halving's going to happen. If, and if you don't go to 100K straight away, it's it's dead. It's yeah, gone. Yeah. It's like, no, that's not right. Right. I think it might, might be more accurate to say, you know, once the halving happens, that rubber band pulling it up to 100,000 is kind of stronger, if you will, but it won't necessarily hit that straight away. It'll take time to get that's there. That's right. That's right. And um, so if we can actually see if it starts going against the rubber band, like let's say it starts declining or whatever, that might be a way to prove it wrong earlier. Um, but I don't see it happening without about a year of data um, after the halving. So I see your point. So you're saying basically right now, as we record this today, the price is what, 8,500 or roughly that area. And let's say it comes to, you know, May 2020, the halving happens in May 9th or May 10th or whatever. And then, if the price just stayed at 9,000 for a year, then it would start to be kind of indicating towards the model is breaking down. Yeah, at that point, I'd be like, right, this is bullshit. We can't use this anymore um, because it's obviously not rubber banding back up to where it's supposed to be, which is somewhere between 55 and 100K, you know, depending on which parameters you use or how you model the data, the historical data. Um, so I'm happy to be um, proven wrong, which is what I intended to do to start with. <laughs> yeah it's funny <laughs> but uh yeah so and then that's kind of where some of these other ideas come out and plan b and i think yourself you've made uh, similar comments that uh you know it might like on like a probabilistic distribution it's going to be starting to rise slowly and that you might expect i don't know whatever uh, i can't remember the numbers off the top of my head but like thirteen thousand a few months after the halving or things like that yeah even then it's getting like you know you sort of how long is a piece of string but I think there, there, there is a different cutoff point after about a year of data, you should have seen that really rubber banding effect happen. Like it might happen slower, it might happen faster than previous halvings, but it really should happen. And if it doesn't happen, then the model doesn't work and, or isn't useful yeah. anymore anyway. Yeah, right. So it's kind of like, a, yeah, well, I mean, honestly, yeah, we don't, we don't actually know, but it's just an interesting way to understand uh, if uh, the model is something useful and remains to be something useful then it kind of has to stay within certain ranges so i guess uh what what do you reckon would be like the i don't know if you know this off the top of your head but what would what, let's say what is kind of like for the model to hold up in say a year after the halving do you know what kind of like the lower end of that range would be yeah i mean i, I would i would hazard a guess around thirty thousand. 
Um, but it it really um, like even if it makes it to thirty thousand and just stays at thirty thousand, that's still like it, it might still be wrong kind of thing because it really needs to, right. It might not be enough. Well, it still needs to get the um, upside, so it can it can be down, but it has to be up to make up for that to get the residuals to be stationary. So it it might be it might go up to hundred k and then back down to thirty k, um, and that would make the residual stationary, um, which would mean the model was still okay. Um, but if it just goes to thirty k and stays there, then the model's not really useful. I see. Yeah, because it didn't go up enough to either the fifty five k level or even a bit above that, or the hundred k level or a bit above that. Obviously. Yeah, that's right. It's just gone to the lower end of the expected frame, and it really should take longer than a year. I think to well, it shouldn't take longer than a year to get over the mean level, back up over the stock to flow estimate, um, which is um, probably, um, I mean, probably enough time. I guess we'll find out. Okay, great. Anything else you wanted to mention analysis-wise? Are there, are there any other things you're looking at and uh, discussing? Um, at the moment, um, I've, I'm, people have requested me to do a lot of stuff, but I just, I really don't have much time to, um, to play with this stuff. Um, I do enjoy, I do enjoy doing it though. So I do get, get into it when I can. Um, some of the things that I've been thinking of, are sort of exploiting those relationships with the shit coins that we have, where we've seen Litecoin is riding Bitcoin's tail. So maybe we can use that to, you know, um, um, sort of short Litecoin, (laughs) (laughs) um, or, or, uh, the same, same thing with Ethereum. So I've been looking into, um, you know, uh, building co-integrating models with those things, but it's, it's, uh, I don't really have enough time to do it properly to get into enough detail to accurately do it. Um, and the other things I've been looking at, are um, adding co-variables to the, um, stock to flow model to try and explain the rest of it. Like, so we said there's, you know, stock to flow plus X equals price. What's X? What can we find X? And you know, is it related to stock to flow? Maybe it's a, a, a mediating variable for stock to flow. Um, so I've been, you know, searching for that for some time, and that's what I that's what I've sort of been working on. Fantastic. So, uh, have you got any other plans in terms of your website? Um, what you want to show on there in terms of uh, for the listeners, like what statistics and things they can expect to find on your site? Um, well. The- <laughs> At, at the moment, they can find the residual likelihood analysis, the stock to flow um, um, mean reversion indicator, and um, they can download all of that as CSV files if they want to. Um, the um, the other thing I was probably I was going to do was going to put some sort of um, more back end data availability, like a JSON API or something like that, that people could connect to if they wanted to use it in automatic trading algorithms, that kind of thing. Um, but again, I'm, I'm working on lost time here. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And also your your name change. You went from fraudster to BTC Econometrics. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, had, I liked the name BTC Econometrics. Um, and that's something that Burger AM had mentioned that um, people had sort of brought up that, oh, this guy's called fraudster. He must be a fraud, you know. Um, but really it was just i have this uh um you know uh, imposter syndrome like i I don't think i'm good enough at anything kind of thing and from years and years ago when i signed up i was like i'm an an imposter i'm not really as good as they say i am at at anything um so that's that's where that came from um but yeah i could see that you know in bitcoin calling yourself fraudster probably not a good match when you know the, the government comes knocking at the door kind of thing (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well no i think you've done a great job i think it's pretty cool uh the work you've done uh, plan b definitely speaks very highly of you um so i i guess that's uh, pretty much it for this episode but uh make sure you let the listeners know where they can follow you and find your work sure um i'm on twitter um at, at bt econometrics and um you can go to my website at bt um and there you will find all of this uh, information that we've been talking about. I tend to post most things to Twitter. So first, so you'll find my updated stuff there. Fantastic. Well, thank you for joining me, Nick. No worries. Oh, have, a, have a nice day. Don't forget to share the episode with your friends and family, and you can find the show notes and transcript at stefanlevera.com slash 154. Thanks for listening. See you in the Citadels. 